Hello everyone, today I am defending my master thesis on automatically identifying interestingness in biomedical literature. Before I begin my presentation, I would like to thank my committee members, Dr. Sheff, Dr. Crivelli, and Dr. Reinflisch. This work is actually it, uh, incepted in when I was uh, doing my internship there last year. So finally we have reached this point and we are presenting my research work. The goal of this study is to automatically identify interesting concepts in a graph of semantic predications. These predications are extracted from biomedical research literature and we are using graph features from those graph of semantic predications. The goal of this work is to support discovery browsing, which is information retrieval and knowledge discovery paradigm. We are comparing several statistical and rule-based models. The training and testing is done using PubMed query logs. To give you a little bit of the background, we all know that there is extraordinary amount of literature available in the form of digital text on the web. Biomedical domain is no different. Uh, Medline, for example, uh, indexes the citations or the journals on biomedical literature. So the illustration on the left here shows how, how many articles are getting indexed in the Medline database every year. And if you can notice that it's, this graph is more of uh, an exponential graph. So that kind of shows that we have a lot of text in that domain. So now that we have this much di digital text, there is ongoing research to extract valuable information from this text. And we are using, or one of the technologies that exploit this information is through literature-based discovery. This literature-based discovery that we are trying to use here uses directly semantic predications. So what are semantic predications? They are the logical triples in the form of subject, predicate, and object whose elements are drawn from unified medical language systems, uh, knowledge sources. SEMREP extracts these predications from the biomedical text, and uh, in, the, in this case, so you have subject, predicate, and object. The subject and object come from the UMLS meta thesaurus, and, uh, and the predicate comes from UMLS semantic network, which forms the predicate. So this is an example of Medline citation, and this is text, and from that text, if we run SEMREP program, we can extract these predications where cytokine, for example, and biological process are the arguments, whereas effects, which is the relationship, forms the predicate. So once we have that, we can actually try and convert it into a graph form, or at least try to visualize it in the form of graph. So for example, in this case, uh, the subject or the object is obesity, and we are extracting all the predications that are connected to this concept. What, what happened to the relationships in the graph? Uh, this is from Medline, which I'll talk about later. In this case, we're not showing it. But for example, here the edges would represent a certain kind of predicate. They're color-coded, I'm guessing. Yes, they're yeah. color-coded. So discovery browsing. Discovery browsing involves basic iterative uh, not involves iterative search and seek behavior. This was developed by Bart Wilkowski and uh, Tom Reinflisch was part of this research. Uh, this involves identifying interesting concepts in a graph of semantic predications. The aim of this work, or discovery browsing, is to understand poorly understood relationships and which can be explored through a novel point of view. And also, when you're doing discovery browsing, you don't have to know all the interesting relationships or, con uh, or concepts beforehand. So now, semantic medline is something that applies the notion of discovery browsing. So it's, uh, it's a web application, which is based on some sem SEMREP predications. It combines the PubMed search and medline citations, and it provides an automatic summarization of the predications that have been extracted from those citations. Uh, it actually shows uh, these predications in form of a graph, uh, the ones that I showed just before. Semantic Medline also facilitates iterative search for knowledge discovery. Again, you can identify interesting concepts in an iterative manner. And once you have found those interesting concepts, you can add to the chain and you can keep on extending your search. 
to give you an example, we have discovery browsing uh, that was elucidated, or obesity paradox, which was elucidated by Dr. Corelli using semantic medline through the process of discovery browsing. So what obesity paradox states is that, or usually we all know that if you're obese, it can normally lead to increased mortality or morbidity. But in the case of uh, his finding, or in case of his elucidation, he proved at molecular level that increased obesity actually predicts decreased morbidity and mortality in ICU setting. So again, he used iterative searches, and as you can see here, he started his search with obesity. He retrieved about 20,000 citations, which resulted in 118,000 predications. But he observed the term PPAR gamma, which was out of context with respect to obesity. So he added that to his chain of searching, and then uh, his search is now obesity and PPAR gamma. Again, he observed the presence of term phthalate, and then again, it was out of context or at least uncommon in, in re regards to obesity and PPAR gamma. So that formed another chain. And then he reached the conclusion, uh, or then he found another interesting term, MEHP, which is uh, a type of plastic lining. Yeah. So overall, you can, you can imagine that someone would have to read 21,000 or maybe more literature to reach that kind of conclusion. And again, we are only showing the iterative searches that actually worked, so it required a lot more searching. So finally, he concluded his logical chain where he said, where he discovered that in ICU setting, there's a lot of plastic around in forms of, I forgot. So, uh, MEHP is form of a plastic, which is again available in ICU setting, and it, it actually forms the lining of those uh, tubes. So that stimulates PPAR gamma, which decreases inflammation. So that actually in turn decreases the chances of mortality and morbidity. So the problem is, with respect to interestingness, that it is something that is either specific to a user, or it is relevant to a topic. When we are talking about relevant to a topic, it can mean that it is unexpected in that context, or uncommon, or un unfamiliar. Sorry, I should get something right. And the problem with discovery browsing it is that it requires uh, manual finding of uh, interesting concepts. So it's an iterative process that requires you to find interesting concepts so you can add it to your chain of search. So in this work, we are trying to identify interestingness automatically. To do that, we are exploring three models, naive Bayes, which is a probabilistic model, support vector machines, which is a non-probabilistic model, and it's based on uh, hyperplanes. And we are using the libSVM uh, algorithm for it. And then rule induction, which is a decision tree-like uh, algorithm. So to discuss our methods, we first extract all the SEMREP predications for training case. Our training data is uh, extracted from predications of Alzheimer's disease. We represent predications in form of a graph, just like I shared before. We identify graph measures or graph matrix that we can use as uh, features. And then we, are, we train and test our algorithm on PubMed query logs. And then again, it's evaluated on PubMed query logs. So this is the overall architecture. Uh, we have SEMMED-DB, which I'll talk about a little later. It's a MySQL database. And from there, we are extracting all the predications and visualizing, or at least assuming, it in the form of graph. And then we are also using PubMed query log. We are normalizing it using MetaMap. It's, again, an NLM uh, program, which can be used to map concepts to uh, UMLS Metasaurus. And then we are using rapid minor tool, and uh, the algorithms that I mentioned before, they're used from that tool. And then we are finally finding our interesting concepts. So I have a, a question. Um, so the algorithms, uh, the uh, libsvm and uh, the rule induction yes. and so forth that you're that you'll be applying, uh, they are, I'm not sure. Perhaps you can uh, you can clarify, but it seems that they are not following the, the, the approach that uh, Mike Corelli did in his work, 
where he identified interesting concepts for obesity based on rarity or um, the concepts being unexpected or unknown or you know, that yes. sort of thing. Yes, we are using PubMed in lieu of uh, actually having users. Can you talk a little bit more about what's your rationale for uh, I, I will, I will just get into that okay, in, good. in a couple of slides. Good. So let's talk about extracting predications from SEMADDB. We have a database of semantic predications. Again, those predications have been extracted from SEM, uh, Medline using SEMREP. There are about 23 million citations and about 69 million predications that have been extracted from those citations. It contains citations from 1865 and onwards. So uh, the disease that we are training it on, Alzheimer's, it has about 40,000 predications extracted from it. So again, in this case, assume the seed concept is actually Alzheimer's. So we make a query that says that you can uh, retrieve all the predications that contain Alzheimer's as subject or predicate, and then finally we have a graph that summarizes Alzheimer's disease in, in citations. Now we are using, so once we have those graphs of predications, we need to think of a way to on how to find interestingness or relevant. Yes, sir? Do you drop the predicate types when you build these graphs? Uh, in this case, we are not considering predicate types, but that's something we want to do later. So in this case, we, our rationale comes from two different graph matrix properties. Uh, one is degree centrality, which is basically connectivity of a node, and it suggests how important a node is in the graph. So in this case, it is connected to three things. We are gonna, we are gonna say the degree centrality for this particular node is three. Uh, and we are using frequency of occurrence, which is basically the instances of an edge, and it suggests commonality or how familiar that a given node is to the other one. So that being said, uh, yes. Yeah. It's a directed graph, right? It is. Because a you have a subject graph. You can, but we are not observing it as. Yeah. Yeah. So in the case of predication graph metrics or features, we have two, two main uh, ideas. One is the features that is based on nodes themselves, and the other one is based on how those connected nodes are with their neighbors. So to begin with, we have total predication frequency. In this case, what we are doing is we are trying to count the number of edges that are connected to, let's say, Alzheimer's in this case. For, for a given node, how many times is it connected to in the literature on Alzheimer's? Uh, so that's one of the things we are calculating. We are also calculating total unique predicates. In this case, we are actually using not the labels or just basically how many different ways is this node connected to in terms of Alzheimer's. Now the other thing that we are considering is, so in the literature of Alzheimer's, not counting Alzheimer's, what are the other things that this neighboring node is connected to? And we are getting three more metrics from that. Metrics from that. I'll explain that with illustration. Uh, these are some of the definitions, but I'll go back. So to begin with, with respect to total predication frequency, Let's assume A as the concept, and in this case, it is connected with seed in three times, in three different ways. So the metric for total predication frequency, we are calculating as three. In terms of total unique predicate, assume that the edge is actually a predicate. So in this case, we have two blue, uh, one red. So we'll take only the graph metric as two because it's connected in two different ways. Now we go to neighboring node, predication frequency. In this case, we are counting all the things that a particular node is connected to. So for example, in this case of B node, it is connected to four different, uh, or it is connected to two nodes, but in four different ways. So that's one of the metric that we are extracting. But in this case, we disregard Alzheimer's because we want to know how popular it is in the literature that involves Alzheimer's disease, for example. The next metric is neighboring node total connectedness. In this case, we are actually counting how many different concepts is it connected to. So for that measure, we are taking the count as two. And then neighboring node unique predications. In this case, we are counting how many unique predications 
it is connecting the two nodes. So in this case, we have I, and then H is connected in two different ways, so the metric for that would be three. So now I talked about train and test on PubMed query, and I'll also try to answer your question here. So PubMed actually provides access to the largest biomedical literature database in the world. It has about 21 million citations. The audience, which was uh, researched by NLM, uh, states that about one-third of it was general public, or is general public, and two-thirds is healthcare professional and domain experts. So now we state our assumption, which is the terms in the search query are interesting to the users. So if they're searching for something, then it means that it is of interest to them. So with respect to PubMed query logs, we first begin by normalizing using MetaMap. And again, we are making sure we only retain the queries that contain, let's say, for example, Alzheimer's, and it has more queries or more concepts. So that by that means we, you had a question? Okay. And then on that, we are computing the user and concept co-occurrences counts. So now the concepts we have, there are concepts that we have from graph of predications, the concept, there are concepts from PubMed query log. They don't mean that, I mean, we are using PubMed query logs in lieu of uh, domain experts to use it as interesting concepts. So in this case, we only retain the data set that exists in both PubMed query logs and SEMMEDDB, or the predications extracted from SEMMEDDB. Uh, we are computing three different thresholds. Uh, uh, one of the thresholds is at negative 0.2 standard deviation and above, and it encompasses about 104 concepts out of 255. So these 104 concepts are marked interesting, and the remaining set is not marked as not interesting. Then the other threshold is at negative 0.15 standard deviation and above. It captures about 84, uh, or we are marking 84 as interesting, and, two, and the remaining as not interesting. And the third threshold is at negative 0.02 standard deviation and above. In this case, we are marking 46, or about 15% of the total data as interesting. So once we, once we have, yeah. I wanted to go back to the question uh, that I asked earlier. Sure. So in, in the, Dr. Corelli's work, it seems like uh, he has essentially defined, or it, uh, serendipitously, uh, realized that concepts that were interesting for the obesity paradox were things that were rare or unknown or, or unexpected. Yeah. Um, in your case, it seems that you are pivoting on uh, PubMed query logs yes. as a, a measure of interestingness, and then you're correlating that with, uh, with concepts in a predications graph that is correct. based on connectedness. Based on connect uh, based on yes. four features five or so, features five features. Yes. 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 Can you like t tell us like what's the intuition? What's the overall intuition? So again, for, the idea like, is that if just someone to, is searching for those concepts, that means they are of interest thing, or they are of interest to them, right? So the only what you're saying is yes. I mean, Mike's work dwell on that, but we cannot really, uh, in order to have concepts marked as interesting would have to go to various domain experts. We won't just ask Mike to do it, right? So we need domain experts who are specialists in eyes or even neurologists so that they can mark those things. And then that would require time. And then you have to see the inter, inter annotator agreement again sure. to make sure that they both comply or all of the domain experts are complying. So in lieu of that, because we know that what people are searching for on PubMed and about two-thirds of that is actually a uh, domain expert. So we assume that, you know, that they won't be just searching for something that's very common out there because they are domain experts. So that's why we are using it in view of, if, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, um, but can you speak a little bit more about uh, how it, or why it is that the metrics you defined on, uh, in terms of connectivity or connectedness, sure. why it is that those, uh, capture interesting news. Then let me try. Okay. Sure. Okay, but again, uh, <laughs> those those comes from the graph metrics intuition that I gave. So 
the degree centrality, mm -hmm. which suggests like how familiar or how connected a node is in the literature. So everything is basically coming from the citations that include, let's say, for example, Alzheimer's disease. So basically, in the neighboring, in those citations, how uh, connected they are. So, so we are exploiting that information. It seems like what you're saying is that the concepts that people search, our intuition is that the concepts that people search for a lot um, together are interesting. And also those things that are mentioned in the literature uh, together a lot are also interesting. Based on the four, based yes. on the metrics. Yes. Not, not necessarily, right? Because he's using, uh, he's making sure the machine learns what's interesting, right? Yeah. So, so if it is, uh, there, there, there might be a possibility that a concept is not well connected. Or, or the most of the concepts what he is trained is not well connected and they are interesting. The only thing is that his features determine his exactly. training set. So, so, so it doesn't mean that it has to be highly connected. Uh, if his training set has concepts which are less connected, huh. then yeah. his, his, his model will actually determine the less connected nodes to be interesting. So it is not necessary that the highly connected nodes has to be yes. interesting. It's a decision tree. Which, which, yeah, it's yeah. a branch it's a somewhere decision. later down the tree. Which, which of, the, uh, of those five features are? We are using all of them. Right, but it's not entirely clear. No, in, in terms of rule induction, it's, it's using all of those attributes. I think we're getting the I think in that case it was, if I, if I remember correctly, I don't have one here, but uh, it showed that it had to have high frequency of occurrence and also high connectivity in the literature. So, so, so it's high frequency and high connectivity? Or? Not just that. I mean, there are, there are more things to it. I don't have the model here, but okay. you, you can look at it. Yes, sir. Okay. Are there other graph metrics that you look at? I guess I should, I should probably let you finish. Yeah, right? sure. Okay. 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 I do have a quick question. This, these negative standard deviations, Yes. can you explain that a little bit? Uh, so in this case, what we did was, once we have the user and co-occurrence concept counts, uh, what we are doing is we are normalizing it, and then uh, we observed naturally that these are the thresholds that we can use. So there's a lot of redundancy. For example, let's take user count, for example. So a lot of these queries are either searched once or twice. So in this case, what we are doing is naturally taking the ones which have been searched, let's say, by users more than twice, or two, more, two or more unique users have searched for it. So that's one of the thresholds. And then the other one is uh, for four users or more, and so on. So what does the negative mean? Uh, so negative is when you compute standard deviation. So how much farther away is it from the standard deviation, or like from the mean? It's negative 0 0.02 standard deviation away from the mean. It's, it's not uh, a normal distribution. OK. So, so, so just you mean to the left, like to the left? The negative means to the left? Yes. OK. It's not like, a, like it's not a negative standard deviation. No, right, no, right, right, it's, okay, it's okay. negative to the... Okay, yes. okay. So now we train our algorithms using three different models, naive Bayes, rule induction, and SVM. Like I said before, we are going to test all, our, uh, all of our algorithms on three different thresholds, uh, negative 0.2 standard deviation and above from the mean, negative 0.15 standard deviation and above from the mean, and negative 0.02 standard deviation and above on the mean. And for training, we are using PubMed query logs for Alzheimer's. So in this case, we observed that rule induction indeed worked the best when we were having more balanced classes. So we decided to use that over SVM, which again showed more promise, but overall its recall was very less. So once it was done, we decided to go with the best F1 score in this case was observed with rule induction when the classes was balanced. So now we get to our evaluation. So once we have selected our rule induction model and we know the threshold which it worked best at was negative 0.2 standard deviation from the mean and above, 
We are testing, on, uh, testing it on three different diseases, schizophrenia, diabetes, and colitis. This is, our per this is the performance statistic on uh, all three of these diseases. And as you can see, precision is actually in the blue, recall is in red, and F1 score is in green. So precision usually stays 65% and above. Recall for colitis is, is low, it's about 17%. But for schizophrenia, it's uh, it's around 36 percent, and F1 score is uh, is about 25 or 26 percent to about 40 percent. So, just to discuss, we chose rule-based over SVM because it was performing better overall. Overall, uh, yes, we observed and we acknowledged that there was low recall, but in our case, we consider precision is more important because we want to capture truly interesting concepts and we don't necessarily care about how many correct numbers or correct uh, concepts we are getting. So, for example... for exa I have to in also because you had the thing that I really based on which. Yeah, and, and another thing to add is, so let's say you are trying to do discovery browsing. Uh, you would like to see 20 correctly classified concepts over, let's say, 200. So, uh, but, but that being said, we definitely want to improve and address uh, recall in the future. So per performance was best overall with schizophrenia, and it is not very surprising because if we are training on Alzheimer's, then uh, both of them, Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia, are actually neurological disorder. So with that respect, we observe 36, uh, or 73 percent precision and 36 percent recall. So to give you an idea of uh, what was observed in the data on Alzheimer's, it was just by a physician. He noticed 10 categories, both in interesting and uninteresting set of concepts. The two, uh, in, in both the cases, the one on the left is interesting, the one on the right is uninteresting. And if you notice, in, in both the cases, usually the concept category makeup and the percentage stays about the same except for signs and symptoms and complication. This just goes to show that we cannot really classify interestingness based on the concept category. Then he also observed that individual concepts were suggestive of several categories of users. One of them was active researcher at the basic or clinical science level. The other one was practicing specialist or practicing primary care physician. In third care, uh, or in third category, it was caregiver or someone who just wanted to get more information about the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. So, uh, a little more example. Uh, in the case of hydroxymethylglutaryl CoA reductase inhibitors, uh, it is fairly new to the investigation for treatment options for Alzheimer's disease. So that likely suggests that a neurologist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist is actually searching for these terms. In the case of uh, curcumin and melatonin, uh, curcumin, which is actually uh, an Indian spice, turmeric, so it kind of suggests that it was either searched by a lay user or, or someone uh, who is not a domain expert here, but someone like primary care physician. Uh, and advanced terminologies like antognosia uh, suggests an expert because this is, uh, this is something new. To conclude, we are presenting a novel approach on identifying interestingness in a graph of semantic predication. We observed that there was a positive correlation between PubMed query log and graph metrics that we derive from the predications. Uh, we strongly believe that the work that we have done will have implication on discovery browsing. And domain expert analysis show that we can actually categorize users so in future work, what we would like to do is we want to get additional graph features. So we want to get semantic class of nodes. So for example, we can classify them based on drugs, based on whether they're genes uh, or uh, diseases. Other thing that we would like to add is we would like to consider edges or the predicates that I was talking about. So get a measure of how many things uh, have a relationship of treatment or inhibition or stimulating. So we want to use that. Uh, matrix too. And uh, other graph features, for example, we were using with, uh, degree centrality, we would like to use with venous centrality. 
And uh, one of the things that we think will really help with the recall also is larger time period of query log. And uh, the separation by class of users suggests that we can actually extend this work into a recommendation system. So we have reached the end, and I would like to thank my committee members, Dr. Sheth, uh, Dr. Reinflesch, and Dr. Corelli. Uh, also, at this time, I would like to thank people I've worked with, uh, Prito's team, Delroy especially, uh, Alan, uh, Ravathi, Lou, and Nishida. Uh, I would like to thank SEMREP team at NLM and uh, some of my friends, uh, if you guys have any questions. I asked them the same question. Um, can you, based on, your, uh, based on your experiments, can you make any general observations or general statements about how to compute interestingness in uh, using biomedical literature? Is anything general that you've learned or observed by virtue of applying uh, the, the techniques and, and the features that you that you have? So, uh, okay, can you ask that question again? Please? Can you make any general statements about how interestingness can be computed in biomedical? Yes. So in this literature? case, we are using rule induction to formally uh, establish a relationship using the graph of predications. And in lieu of, uh, you know, in lieu of biomedical researchers to determine those interestingness concepts from by uh, PubMed query logs. So what basically we are suggesting is that the the measures also that we have can be used to identify interestingness. Okay, let me so rephrase this yeah. question. Uh, uh, what? What features do you think are important? Okay, let, let's start from there. What features do you think are important to find interestingness according to you? I know it's a, it's a tough thing because the model is handling most of the things for yes. you, yes. but based on your observations, uh, what characteristics of these features played a prominent role for you to get an interestingness of a concept? So connectivity of a node, of an opposing argument, I think you know opposing argument, or the neighboring node to the seed node, those played an important role in the model, and also frequency of occurrence, and yeah. even like the unique. Well, did it have to be higher or lower? Uh, so, so again, you know, rule based kind of goes one by one, and in, in some cases, yes, it, it had that interval basically. So yes, higher frequency mattered. Uh, in some cases, we were capturing lower frequencies or higher connectedness. Oh, okay. So lower frequency and higher connectedness was also getting captured. So what would you yeah. say to someone if they wanted to explore, uh, or if they wanted to find interesting concepts in biomedical literature, like where, where would you point them to go? What would you suggest that they investigate first to the capture book, interesting The things? first thing to investigate the Most would, important thing. Yeah, I would say the most important thing would be how well connected that opposing argument is in the query. So mode. connectivity. Here, here. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think it's a, so in the biomedical literature, there are, uh, when it comes to discovery and all these kind of things, uh, the domain expert assume, like let's say you, t you build the graph on PubMed, and uh, so you, you will definitely see uh, genes like P53 uh, has a lot of incoming and outgoing links, and that basically suggests that that is a, a well-studied gene because uh, those connections are coming from multiple documents and maybe with different predications. So uh, having something interesting or something uh, surprising through that gene, it's rare because it's, it's, uh, it's a well-studied gene. So uh, considering connectedness is obviously a, a good starting point, but I would suggest to uh, do like, so she, he has like five different uh, features, right? So what would be interesting to do is like leave one up, leave one feature out and see what's the what's the performance and do that for all five yeah. and see which actually uh, actually Plays give a you bigger the, role yeah, yeah. You know, kind of, prioritizing the features yeah maybe you can do that study and include that yes sir so your i loved your motivating example of the physician think of one concept of oh, this is related this is related it's like a chain of associations yes right? and Maybe it's because interestingness is such a subjective word, but when yes, I think of interestingness, yes. it's like, I've 
discovered an association that was not obvious and was a little bit surprising, right? Yes. So just when I think about network features related to connectivity and centrality, to me, those, those speak to common or expected or kind of routine associations, right? So w I wonder, wouldn't it be the case of more interesting features, more interesting associations, they're actually found at the periphery of these networks based on some kind of the distance from one concept or relation to another concept. You can find these long, strong associations. Mm -hmm. Those are interesting, right? Yes. So I'm wondering why, um, I guess I'm just looking for the motivation behind so using again, all of these uh, centrality-based features. Yes. Right? So I think, again, going back to the motivation. So in the case of discovery browsing, we are going with the idea that we don't have to know everything beforehand. So even like if someone's a lay user, uh, he can go and search for something that, that we can present it as interesting based on what we are observing, let's say, through PubMed query logs in this case. So again, okay, yeah, so you're just fun. looking for common associations between concepts. Yeah, I think so the, the, big, uh, the difference that uh, the your point and his study that what I see is he's kind of into one hop thing and you are trying yes. to get into the path. Like uh, whether not, it's away from the exactly uh, north and the, the neighbor is what we are looking for. To begin your search, the exact neighbor that can really help you and explore. Is so okay, so I want to search for Alzheimer's and yeah. you want to say, well why not search for these related concepts too? No, yes, along with that. So we, you are searching for Alzheimer's and in this case we can present curcumin or melatonin and then, you know, then present those as a set of concepts that can be particularly interesting to look at. And then again, like I said, positively in future we can, we can categorize based on users and well, I think what he has is actually very interesting, right? Because uh, interestingness, again, it's very subjective. What may be interesting to a domain expert would be the kinds of things that you have talked about. Those things are not highly connected, but are sort of far away in the periphery. But for uh, someone who is uh, from a different domain, an expert, I'll be in a different domain, they might find the things that are highly connected to be quite interesting. So, so, um, so I think I think just a couple of interesting points to note. One is that um, uh, I think the that, that I was going to that right now is that um, uh, perhaps from the perspective of domain expert, uh, what you've done seems to make sense because you took the example from domain expert and such. Yes. Uh, if you just juxtapose your work with, let's say, the work that um, uh, Ashutosh is doing, and he's talking about consumer uh, health search behavior. Uh, clearly, for consumer uh, it needs and interestingness, uh, the needs, you know, the expected answers will be totally different, yeah. right? And I think you didn't get to that. I don't think you, uh, your, your work really covered uh, interestingness from the consumer perspective, even though one third of your uh, things are mm -hmm. that. So I think we might want to put that caveat a little bit, saying that at least at this stage you didn't get, uh, you know, uh, enough to do. In fact, if at all you could to come up with a solution, uh, more complete, complete solution, then you would have a model for the user, whether the user is an expert versus a consumer, yeah. and for each of them, you'll calibrate interestingness totally differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think that did not come through, and I think we need to you know, make sure that it's up, you know, upfront saying that, look, I'm pleasing these two-thirds of the users, not one-third kind of yeah. Yeah, The uh, other thing, <coughs> I think all of us should uh, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I may be wrong here, but uh, um, I think the only primary reason why you can even say you are getting where you are getting is ultimately you have a, a good extraction, a semantic extraction, the SEMREP thing. Yeah. I don't think that this whole business of centrality and all of this, thing, if you are done purely on statistics on uh, word occurrences or pure IR thing, I don't think this would have gone anywhere. It, it, it didn't, because last time what we were trying to do was we were kind of getting uh, information or using information using the TF-IDF principle, and we were observing that the interesting concepts that we were capturing that time <coughs> were very less relative to the concepts that were uninteresting. Yeah. So, in fact, this is also a message for much of our team, right? I mean, we primarily, more or less, almost every problem we try to solve, we try to bring in the value of background knowledge. The background knowledge here is the same rep, right? And the, it, it is the work that NLM has done already 
uh, to create that knowledge base on which this whole thing rides. I mean, otherwise, if you were to do purely on the textual thing, I don't think that this would be interesting at all or would not have gotten anything. And uh, again, so you are able to really uh, attack the problem in a very different way because, you know, that uh, existence of work. That is not original work here, but that's that. But again, the, these two points that we just noted, that A, you are focusing on, you know, this one type of user, and B, that this work because of that. This has not yet come out well, and it should come out in your paper much better, right? I mean, and, uh, you know, that way people would not question also how, you know, give me the basis why it worked kind of thing, right? Yeah. And also, it would have been ideal if you were to put side by side saying, you know, I try to do this and let me come give you the results without SEMREP and with SEMREP. Okay. Just side by side, with everything almost going. Of course, you might have to do some uh, uh, work in to make sure that it is implemented well with the without SEMREP. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, if it is done side by side, say, look, you try to do without background knowledge, uh, I don't, you know, this is where you can get just pure straightforward statistical techniques mm -hmm. or IR techniques. And now I'm adding this, I'm getting here. But even that work is limited to uh, currently the expert user, not this one third. And that will give the frame, right framework of what you achieve. Yeah, I think it, this, is, this work is excellent, Garish. What it shows is that interestingness is a, a very complex subject, right? And yeah. It depends uh, not just on the user, but also a number of different features <coughs> point to interestingness uh, under the hood. And you've essentially found a way to, to capture some of these um, and to you know bring in, into perspective the difficulty of, of this task. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I think you may, if you have clarified all, most of the question here arise difficulty in understanding whether you are doing authority ranking or interestingness. So if you have made it like clear and from the beginning, let's say you are trying to say without that distinction, you are making a Google kind of search that is interesting. Yeah. Right, connectivity and centrality, all those are like page time kind of ranking. So that so is that, think, that yeah. was confusing to me. Like these questions ask you whether popularity is the interestingness. So that's why it should be it, it is confusing. So, okay, yeah. yeah. I think it had yeah, make, thing uncommon, uncommon, un, unexpected yeah. kind of yeah, Maybe making it, yeah, that's that's it. making it clear, right? Yeah. I think yeah. I would make it as uh, who who tra who who give you the training data set, Mike, right? No, no, we are extracting it, basically. But so these are the SEMREP predications that we extract okay. from the SEMREP DB. Okay, and who 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 annotated the it? The annotation is done using the PubMed query logs. Ah, okay, okay. Then I think uh, yeah. I completely agree with what Dr. Shet mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Query log, like in the query log, do you have some so it's cool currency in the query log? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, so, but, uh, so that's why we are using it's, those three. It's really interesting. So the more number of users who are searching it. We can say that it was interesting it to not just one person, but more. Really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the work on interestingness is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize if I wasn't very clear. So something is interesting if <laughs> there are a lot of related topics to it. Okay. Not necessarily, right? Not no, necessarily. not mine. No. And, you know, I mean, I think you go back to the work, some of you might be aware of, um, and the law will tell you why you should know our past work. But um, some of you might be aware of uh, uh, semantic association work. And there was a lot of work on ranking. And uh, there were two uh, distinct, uh, pa you know, uh, line of work that we pursued. Um, uh, 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 Alaman, uh, who, you know, in fact, that I had worked with, um, had pursued one line of work where he, uh, use the statistics on um, uh, number of connections, uh, meaning how often two concepts are connected and um, uh, oh, yes. how popularity, popularity um, rarity, rarity, and then context, which we really talked about at the end, in terms of the classes and so on. Right, and, and, and so he, mm -hmm. develop, uh, he developed based on that and came up for uh, took a uh, different route. Uh, and he, he, she went with a rather formal measure uh, and uh, defined uh, something based on entropy. Uh, so she, the same rank paper is all based on entropy. But ultimately, um, you know, um, when you um, have uh, uh, a, 
somebody asked for a question, like in that case, how the two things are related, how well they are related. Uh, the uh, uh, answer needs to be unusual most of the time, uh, rather than something that is uh, very, uh, very obvious. Right? So these are, and, and um, Kemafor had um, basically a selection. She had a slide bar. So on one hand of, uh, one end of it was a discovery, and another end of it was, I don't know, do you remember the, what, what that was? Uh, the one end was discovery? Exploratory. Exploratory, yeah. Right? So, so it is uh, the purpose. Are you looking for very extreme and rare circumstances? Mm -hmm. Are you looking for something that uh, reconfirms and, you know, uh, and that, uh, again, that, you know, if this work was taken further down, it will require to go in the, along that line, meaning that needs to be done. This is just currently one spot there. Actually, in reality, uh, uh, the reason why all of you are asking question about interestingness is that it, is, it depends, right? Mm -hmm. It will vary for different people for the purpose. Yeah. And then you will have to you know, be able to tell system or allow mm. system to understand what type of things you want. A simplistic would be uh, just simp uh, is uh, saying your user is uh, a naive, naive user or a consumer. Yeah. So this is the interestingness and expert. The more complex could be to give you various you know, buttons or various uh, slide uh, rules to you know, precisely say what you want in, from the system. Alima and the Camofor, I think both had that, right? Where yeah, slide I think both had uh, some yeah. form of uh, selection thing. Yeah, right. Cool. Any more questions? Dr. Ryan Flesh? All right. Mike. So uh, you guys, uh, uh, you know, excuse and then let the committee ask the questions. Good job.